This video will review movement disorders and symptoms of neuromuscular diseases for the OT board exam. Many of these symptoms sound very similar. Tremors, dyskinesia, clonus. So what do they mean? Find out in this video. If you are new to this channel, my name is Jeff and I am a board certified and licensed occupational therapist practicing in the United States. If you are only watching this on YouTube, you're missing out by not enrolling in my free OT board exam prep course. Why should you enroll? Well, the course contains organized videos by categories, which are easier to navigate than these videos on YouTube. You can also save your progress and get access to helpful study guides. You can test your knowledge with the quizzes and receive feedback of your performance from the comprehensive scoring system. There are even practice exams such as the CST with answer rationales all for free. While this course isn't as polished as the popular commercial ones, it is in active development, sir. So there are new review materials added regularly and it is constantly being improved. Still not sure if my course is worth your time? Check out my testimonials from students who have passed after taking my course. Thousands have already enrolled. I would also appreciate if you mentioned OT Dude to your peers and in the AOTA's board exam prep Facebook group if you found it helpful. You can support the continued development of this course by donating or by checking out some of my products in the video description. I'm the OT Dude and let's get functional. For the OT board exam, you should be familiar with the conditions that have associated movement disorders. Examples include ALS, multiple sclerosis, muscular dystrophy, Huntington's disease, myasthenia gravis, and peripheral neuropathy. What causes these movement disorders in the first place? Well, one cause is from the clinical neurological pathology, such as due to damage to parts of the brain, like the basal ganglia. A second cause is from medications that affect motor behavior, also called neuroleptics. An example that comes to mind is what causes tardive dyskinesia from medications. You may also have heard about the term extrapyramidal disorders, which is an older term that is the same as movement disorders. The definition for movement disorders is excess movement that is unrelated to weakness or spasticity. Other interchangeable terms for movement disorders are hyperkinesia and dyskinesia. Same thing. The opposite would be hypokinesia or bradykinesia or akinesia. These are also used interchangeably as well. So you can think of movement disorders as two major categories, hyperkinesia or hypokinesia. Simple. Here's a table of the classifications of the movement disorders by these two types of terminologies. You can pause the video now just to take a closer look, but don't take too long because we're going to talk about it anyways. We just went over bradykinesia and akinesia, which is slowed movement and the absence of movement, respectively. Apraxia is defined as difficulty performing skilled motor movements. Apraxia is seen in patients, for example, with Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease. There's ideational apraxia, and then there's ideomotor apraxia. Ideational, think idea, like you have no idea how to do the necessary movements for an object intended purpose, so you use it wrong. An example of ideomotor is being unable to copy someone's movement intentionally when thinking about it. Kind of like a mime who's copying someone else. Unlike ideational apraxia, where you have like no idea, for ideomotor, you know what you really want to do, but you can't physically do it like for the motor program. To remember ideomotor, remember the word motor for how you move your muscles. To remember apraxia, think of prax as in practice, as in difficulty performing already practiced movements. And then the A prefix, A dash, means without. Holding ticks under hypokinesia is when someone such as with Tourette syndrome suppresses their tics for short amounts of times for as long as they can. An example of holding tics is when you're in a social situation and you try to prevent your tic from happening. 
and it's kind of like a sneeze. You often try to hold it, but it kind of has to come out sooner or later. A tick, like a regular tick without the holding part, under the hyperkinesia category, is an uncontrolled sudden movement, either a motor tick or a sound tick, like something that is vocal, called a vocal tick. Examples of motor ticks include nose wrinkling, head twitching, eye blinking, lip biting, face grimacing, and shoulder shrugging. Ticks can also be more complex too than just like singular motor muscle groups, such as kicking and jumping, which involve like your knees, joints, and your hip joints, and your ankles, right? Cataplexy is the sudden loss of muscle tone while someone is awake, and it's often most associated with narcolepsy. It can be brought on by emotions such as laughter or even stress. Cataplexy can range from mild such as eyelid drooping to the more severe such as even the complete collapse to the ground. And people may even at this point be unable to move or speak. This more extreme case, it kind of reminds me of like when a robot powers down or something. Cata means downward like catatonia and plexi means stroke or seizure. Catatonia, as mentioned just now, is a psychomotor syndrome that is often associated with schizophrenia, but it is also present with other psychiatric disorders, such as affective disorders. Catatonia actually has two types. The most common akinetic type, which we often think about, and also the excited opposite type. Akinetic catatonia is characterized by immobility, mutism, like not talking, staring, and rigidity. Rigidity, hard word to say. The less common excited type of catatonia is characterized by psychomotor agitation, such as the need to move around, being agitated, like the term combativeness, or even echopraxia, the mimicking of someone's movements. There's a third type called malignant catatonia, which is when catatonia leads to other health problems like health medical conditions. To remember catatonia, imagine that a cat weighs a ton, which is part of the word tonia. They're not going to move at all or move much, and they'll just kind of stare at you. Freezing phenomenon and hesitant gait, you'll probably think about Parkinson's disease, right? So it's kind of just what it sounds like, as in the freezing or the hesitation, the slow hesitation of one's gait during, say, functional mobility or ambulation. Hypothyroidism, you know, it has an effect on neuropsychiatric functions and also can cause slow movements as well. So hence the term hypothyroid slowness. A symptom of hypothyroidism is these slow movements and the weakness too. It's caused by the atrophy of the type 2 fast twitch muscle fibers. So this results in the slowing of muscle contractions. Rigidity is often thought of as being stiff, right? Or the inflexibility of muscle. And it's a sign actually of Parkinson's disease. The muscles are like really tight and they're difficult to move and they may stiffen up involuntarily. And it's kind of like a muscle spasm. Rigidity is not affected by position or velocity, by the way. And there are two types of rigidity that you probably learned about. Lead pipe rigidity and the cogwheel rigidity. Lead pipe is characterized by the feeling of frozen muscles that are unable to move, kind of like that pipe that carries, you know, like plumbing or something. Cogwheel, on the other hand, is like muscle spasm, but it has like small jerky or clicking motions, hence the name cogwheel. Like... And in researching muscle stiffness, I found out about stiff person syndrome, which is characterized by muscle stiffness and the repeated episodes of painful muscle spasms. Muscle stiffness then can fluctuate, and then there may be these spasms, like really extreme ones. So left untreated, stiff person syndrome can really impact one's daily performance due to the lack of motor function and how it can just come on and totally make you so stiff. Let's move on to the category of hyperkinetic movement disorders now. I won't go over every term from the table as some of these are really irrelevant for the OT board exam and some we already covered earlier too. So 
they're just going to be like the opposite, right? They're more active movement terms instead of the slower or lack of movement terms. Acathesia is considered to be a side effect of antipsychotic drugs, and it's characterized by the general motor restlessness and the urge for continuous movement. Examples of this include rocking back and forth and pacing around. This motor restlessness sounds very similar, right, to tardive dyskinesia TD, but TD actually involves movements and less generalized movements in like the face or the mouth or the arms such as while you're sitting down. For TD, tardive means late developing, like the symptom being developed later as in the side effect from medications probably. Ataxia, it means without coordination. More specifically, a lack of coordination with one's voluntary movements, such as with walking and balance. So when do you call for ataxy? Well, if you had too much to drink and you lack the coordination with balance and walking. So that's one way to remember it. A similar disorder to ataxia is dysmetria, which is characterized by the impairment of smoothly uncoordinated movements, such as with the speed, the distance, and one's range of motion. I think of dysmetria of when people have like difficulty performing the finger to nose repeatedly and they like overshoot it or they undershoot it, like the targets, like their nose or their finger, instead of doing it normally and just perfectly. To remember dysmetria, dys means difficulty, right? With difficulty with something. And metria, think of it like metria metronome. So going back and forth, like, like with your finger to nose screen that you do to test for dysmetria. Nystagmus, it's the coordination disorder of the eyes and it I can remember this one easily because it's such a unique word, like nystagmus, like you can't forget this one. It's when your eyes, they overshoot or undershoot their target, similar to earlier. And when it moves, when you ask someone to move it intentionally, such as like left or right, when they follow a finger or something like that, it may like kind of jump or overshoot it and it just doesn't look normal. So it's a very unique kind of phenomenon and you'll notice it pretty easily too. Athetosis results from an overactive basal ganglia and or the excess of dopamine in your brain. And it's characterized by these involuntary rhythm movements that are slow and rolling. It can be thought of as, I think of the animal snake-like, and it often affects the hands and the feet. Athetosis may sound familiar because you probably learned about athetoid cerebral palsy, which also has slow rhythm movements. So that's how you can remember that. Chorea also has the same pathophysiology and is characterized by repetitive, brief, irregular, and rapid involuntary movements. It's repetitive, brief, irregular, rapid, and involuntary. So these can be very abrupt and unpredictable. And so chorea can affect multiple parts too, like the face, the mouth, the trunk, and the limbs. Belismus is a type of Chorea that involves violent, involuntary flinging of the extremities. Belismus movements are, they're often very intense, way more intense than chorea. So when you see belismus, think going ballistic. And to remember chorea and it being related to this belismus, think of chorea as the country and how it kind of like spells when you pronounce it. Korea, as in North Korea and the president launching a ballistic missile test. You may have heard of the term also hemibolismus, and I think with Huntington's disease, and it's characterized by the violent involuntary limb movements on one side of the body, hence the term hemi, like hemiparesis. Dystonia is characterized by the sustained involuntary movement contraction. It's also known as spasms from one part of the body. So there's focal dystonia, to multiple parts of the body in addition to that. So that's called generalized dystonia. Focal dystonia, it can affect the eyelids, the neck, muscles, vocal cords, the hands, wrists, and jaw. With generalized dystonias, it's considered more rare and it's often hereditary. So because generalized dystonias affect multiple parts of the body, it can put people in very abnormal positions 
and in postures such as with gait patterns to like tiptoed walking. Hyperplexa, another rare, rare hereditary neurological disorder, and it affects infants and newborns, but it can also affect children and adults as well. This hyperplexa is characterized by an excessive startle reaction. And when you get startled, you typically have like a flexion kind of posturing, such as with trunk flexion and response to innocuous stimuli. And this can have a major impact on daily life as well, right? As it can probably be not suppressed and it can present with problems such as when you're dressing or something. Similarly with jumping disorder, like when one jumps all of a sudden, it's also known as, it's a really interesting name, jumping Frenchman of Maine disorder. Yes, yeah, is really what it's called if you look it on Wikipedia. Jumping Frenchman of Maine disorder is the full term. It's characterized by a severe startle reaction. Think of being jumpy, right? Although we all normally have a startle reaction, like in response to something that may suddenly scare us, those with the jumping disorder react really excessively. They like literally jump or they may scream or they may flail, like overly dramatic kind of thing. They may even hit or throw objects. And they may even exhibit echolalia and echopraxia too. So that's really interesting. By the way, I have a video on these two terms from my psychosocial terminology video. So the link will be in the description because I already talked about it. Myoclonus is characterized by slow or quick muscle jerks or twitches. It can be mild or severe in the form of a quick one or a slow one. And it could be rhythmic or non-rhythmic muscle jerks. So that one's a little harder to remember because it can be both extreme cases of mild, severe, quick, or slow. And this myoclonus, it can be spontaneous or it can be even triggered from environmental things like noises or lighting or even movements. And actually, you may have experienced some form of this myoclonus normally, such as when your leg like jerks when you're falling asleep. But as a disorder, myoclonus, it may also involve other parts such as your hand, your arm, your leg, facial muscles, or multiple muscle groups. And myoclonus actually has many causes, but some conditions include dementia, Huntington's disease, and Parkinson's disease. And actually, if you think about myoclonus, how it presents, it's very similar and actually to ticks. And they may look the same, but they have different root causes and uh, associate conditions of which cause them. Ticks can often be sensed beforehand too, so that's one difference, and has like a warning. Whereas with myoclonus, it can also come on spontaneously. So there's one difference there. So basically that covers the movement disorders for the OT board exam. I won't review the remaining terms as they're kind of irrelevant or I covered them already in my other psychosocial terminology video. So if you haven't seen that one, definitely highly recommend checking that out for the OT board exam. Hope this helps and good luck studying.